Today, though, we're going to we're going to move a little deeper into where we where I've been headed. Um, as we're going to be later in August, we're going to be talking about uh, scripture and its and its uh, misuse, misunderstanding, and and uh, how we should properly handle it. But moving there, I want to talk about discipleship. And today's message is titled uh, "The Marks of Discipleship." So before we go any deeper than that, I just want to open it in prayer because. Sometimes when you talk about discipleship, two things happen. People misunderstand what discipleship is, and two, they, they start feeling guilty needlessly, and then they project that outward. So I think we need to come against that. So I just want to, I want to pray for this before we, we go into the Word this morning. Father in heaven, help me today to articulate what true discipleship is, what it looks like, how it plays out, how it can completely rewrite who we are, what we are, for the better. Help me, Lord, not to downplay it, not to overplay it, but to, to really make it stand out in our hearts that it's something that will, will revolutionize our lives as believers and followers of Christ. I pray, Lord, today as we go through your word that we would honor it, that, uh, that Lord, I would uh, help articulate that in a way that will be honoring and pleasing to you and beneficial to all of us, myself included. We commit this, this message to you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm gonna gonna slightly do this different. We're gonna start with the text, and then we'll come back to the main idea. So today's text is in Luke chapter nine, start at verse twenty-three. Follow along with the reading of the word. Then he said to them all, "Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it." But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man, will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. This portion of text is the words of Jesus himself. It's recorded in Matthew as well. Slightly different. Um, depending on, on how the writer uh, wrote it down, which is the reason why we're going to be talking about Scripture so much near the end of uh, August. But today we're looking at what many consider Dr. Luke. They consider him one of the, the, the only doctors that wrote um, uh, the Scriptures. And Luke records in, in chapter 9 um, what Jesus said. And what we see in verse 23 is, is, is where we're going to focus on, but I want to bring the main idea of what discipleship is, and it's this. This is what we're going to try to wrap our heads around today. Discipleship is a wholehearted devotion to follow Jesus, which will completely transform your life. See, that, that's, what, that's what faith is. It's a transformation. What can I give you for a word picture? Have you ever seen a nice little caterpillar? Little furry caterpillars? You ever seen how gross they look when they're all in their cocoon? Like a weird looking thing. And then have you seen when they come out as a, as a butterfly? That's transformation. You, you, be, you go from one thing to something completely different. Preferably something that's better. Clearly, if you're crawling on the ground and, the, and the, your, your mode of transportation is you know, really close to the dirt crawling on the ground, that's not as beneficial as having wings and being able to fly great distance. Obviously, that's something better. Well, discipleship is kind of like that mentality. We are, we are called to transform. We're not called to just be good people. I, I say this a lot, but I, it's, it's a real problem within Christian, Christendom that we're just called to be good people. And then we still struggle with anxiety. We still struggle with stress. We still struggle with anger. We still struggle with forgiveness. We still um, seem to never pray and nothing seems to happen. We, we, we seem to not be any different except that we're good people who may not say as many swear words. If that's what Christianity is, I quit right now. I didn't come to know God in that way. I knew what that way was like before I knew Jesus. And I, I'll say this, this is one of my, my I live by this, this thought, is that there's going to be a lot of good people occupying the depths of hell and there's going to be a lot of scoundrels who are going to occupy the places of heaven. What do I mean by that? The scoundrels have learned that they were scoundrels. 
they repented, they transformed themselves, and they became disciples of Jesus. And the good people, well, they just didn't swear as often. But in their heart, it was still dark. It was still ungodly. It was still unholy. It was still unrighteous. And it was still unchanged. What a missed opportunity. And so discipleship is a wholehearted. It's, you, you can't, God doesn't want a little piece of you. I've said this before. God isn't very good at sharing. You know how we always tell our kids to share? God doesn't share you. You're, he doesn't want to share you. He doesn't want to share me. He wants all of his kids completely to himself. And the sooner we accept that, and the sooner we, we, we realize that's a beautiful thing, the sooner our faith begins to, to take on a new form. Because what happens is a lot of people, they, they want, they want their, their, their faith to, you know, just to be like another accessory in their life. I'm sorry, Christianity, being disciples of the way, is not an accessory for you to have. So people think you're a good person. That's what the West has done with Christianity in the last hundred years. Christianity should be a complete and utter denial of who you were before you knew Jesus and a completely transformed life of who you are now in Jesus. Does that mean you do it perfect every day? Absolutely not. Because is there anybody perfect in here? I'm looking. You, you've learned now that that's a great question. None of us are perfect. But we follow the one who is. Amen? And he is the one that starts to transform us from the inside out. We like to sing that song, from the inside out. Transformation, uh, metamorphosis is from one thing to another. It, it transforms us. And so that's what discipleship is. Discipleship isn't a program. And unfortunately, churches tend to do that. They, they, they make a discipleship program. Discipleship is not a program. Although you can make it into that. Although you can make salvation into a program. You can, you can make just about anything into a program if you want to sit down and write it all out. But see, writing things out doesn't grasp the heart. It doesn't transform the mind. It doesn't change the soul. It might, it might make an itch or it might you know, touch, a, touch an itch a little bit, but it doesn't bring the transformation that you really need to have. And so what do we see? So we can go into, back into Luke. And in verse 23, which is the key verse today, Jesus said to them, whoever wants, I'll stop right there for a second. Wants. I want to break this verse down. Discipleship is something you want. If you don't want it, that's why you struggle with your faith. It, you have to choose it. This is why I know some of you are, are probably, uh, you're, you're a little bent to the Calvinistic side of theology. I want you to know uh, it's got problems. You could argue with, you know, John MacArthur is your defender. I get it. He's a great man. He's going to be in heaven. Sorry, the five points of Calvinism is flawed. Because of the fact you are a free moral agent, you have to choose Jesus. That is the only limiting factor to God's working in your life, is your choice to be the disciple that he has asked you to be. To become the son and daughter. To move into royalty. To become the co-heir with Christ. You, ha you have to choose it. Whoever wants. To be my disciple. Now, want is an interesting word because want is like I want something. You know, like right now, I want. Uh, I, I I want a nice BLT. Uh, I want a nice cup of coffee. Don't get me one. We're in the middle of a message. But you know what I mean? Like I, I want something like that. I I I, I want to have you know a nice sports car. I, I want to be you know athletic. I want. But want is just the starting point. Whoever wants to be my disciple has to move into the second part of this want. They must. Did it say you should? Even when you, when you translate that over from the Greek, it is, it, is, it is a definite. Must deny themselves. And a lot of Christians who struggle in their faith, they do not deny themselves. Well, they offended me, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to forgive them. Jesus says, if you don't forgive, I cannot forgive you. As one example... Right? There, we, the rubber has to hit the road. And as we see the days getting darker, the return of Jesus could happen this afternoon. My question is, have you denied yourself? So whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. What is a disciple? A disciple is somebody who is wholeheartedly devoted to following Jesus. We were never called Christians. 
That happened in, in, in Corinthians, in Corinth. That's when they got insulted and were called Christians. It was an insult. It was, they were trying to blaspheme. They were trying to put down. They were trying to insult us. And over 2,000 years, it's now become, uh, a, you know, something to, uh, a badge of honor. See, we were called followers of the way. What's the way? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. So if you're wondering what our theology is in this church, we know that there is no way to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Through the cross. You're going to have to visit Calvary. I don't mean physically. I mean in your heart. You're going to have to show up there. You're going to have to die there with Jesus. You're going to have to give it to Him. He will take your sins. He will take your burdens. He will leave them in the tomb. And He will set you free because He walked out of the tomb three days later. And that's where faith begins. And that's how we, we start to become a disciple. We have to deny ourselves. Deny yourself. Getting angry is a good one. You know, I don't just mean getting angry. Just angry can be righteous too. You can have righteous anger. But a lot of times our anger is, how dare you do that when they drive by, right? A lot of times uh, we, we don't deny ourselves. Well, we know that we should say no to this sinful habit that we do. But we refuse to do that. We don't deny it. Well, you know, it's not that bad. The second you have to kind of make up arguments to justify how bad you are, you've already, you're already losing the battle. You know what the good news is? God will still forgive you for doing that. He is still, his hand is still extended. How do we know that? Because Christ died for all. The, the only thing that has to change is that we have to deny ourselves and follow him. But you notice on there, we go a little bit farther, well, you're supposed to take up something. Their cross. You're not supposed to pick up my cross. I don't have to pick up your cross. That takes a lot of weight off our shoulders. How many here, you know, sometimes you feel like you're trying to take up somebody else's cross for them? Parents, you're, you're guilty. You're guilty of that. We all are. I, I am at times too. You know, you, you feel an obligation. You, you want to you wanna do that for them. There comes a point in time where they have to make the decision. The best way to raise a godly family is to live a godly life. Unfortunately, that means you're going to have to deny yourself. Pick up your cross every day. I love this, 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 this part, this verse, because of this part. It's a daily grind. That's a good thing. We, we, you know, we think faith, oh, I should, you know, there should be easy times that are hard. You know, it's going to be kind of an ebb and flow, and that's true. But the reality is, is that daily you fight the flesh. The old you is still there as long as you're walking on this earth. And so it's, kind of, it's, got, it's got desires, it's got wants and needs, right? Some of them are good, some of them are bad. You know, uh, wanting to eat so you don't starve to death, that's a good need. Uh, wanting to eat too much, that's a bad need, right? And so this is something we see. We have to daily pick up our cross. What's the cross entail? The cross of Jesus. It, it, it's interesting if you, if you go back and look at the crucifixion of Jesus. What did he do? He literally... Um, lift, picked up the physical cross and took it to his place of death. You know what else is interesting about that story? And, and the realities of, of what happened that day? He couldn't finish it. Never thought of that, did you? He, 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 never, he never got that cross, that wooden cross. He never dragged it all the way to Calvary. He never got it all the way up the hill. He, he gave out. Somebody else had to help him with it. This is why church is 100% essential in your life. Church isn't the Sunday service. Church is all of us together, making relationships, doing things together, trying to reach the, the community both uh, in, in, in mercy but also in, with the gospel. We, we spur one another on to love and good works. It is absolutely essential that, that, that we pick up our cross daily, but sometimes we're going to need somebody to help pick us up. And that's what we do when we gather together. That's what we do when we serve, is that we're picking each other up. And, and a church that can do that in spirit and in truth is an unstoppable church that will completely revolutionize whatever community it is planted in. I don't know about you, but I want to be part of a church like that. And I think that we are part of a church like that. And we're only going to get better as long as we keep going in these principles of the Lord, that we deny ourselves daily. Because we want to serve him. We want to follow him. But we, we learn that we must deny ourselves and daily pick up that cross and follow him. And so discipleship is this. 
It is the desire to get up every morning and say, today I'm going to serve you uh, wholeheartedly, Jesus. I remember when I've had a couple of, uh, of both friends and family members who, who gave up uh, drinking and smoking addictions that they had, especially the smoking one, because it was bad for their health. But I remember uh, hearing them talk about their story. Like, how did, how did you quit? You, you know, for 20 years you, you smoked and you couldn't stop and you, you tried all these different things and nothing worked. And then what it came down to was they made the decision that today, I don't know about tomorrow, but for today, I won't be a smoker. And you know what? When you start stacking those up one day after another, a year goes by and they realize, I haven't smoked in a year. I haven't drank in a year. I haven't been intoxicated in a long time. I haven't been high and, and, and blasted out in, in, in a long time. Because they make that internal decision that they're going to trust God and they're going to take it one day at a time. And there's an old song that a lot of you know in this room. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's all I'm asking from you. Now, we don't need to sing that because it's a little twangy for my liking, but the truth still remains. We need to get up every morning and say, uh, one day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's all I'm asking today. I don't know what's going to happen on Wednesday. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow on the 1st. But today, I want to serve you with everything I've got. And here's all I've got to offer. It isn't much. But isn't it interesting how God takes the coal and through the pressure and through the time, transforms it into something precious like a diamond. And you are the diamond that God is transforming. And so that's what we see here. And Jesus goes on after that. In verse 24, he says, whoever wants to save their life. So if you want to save your life, is this, are they just saying save your life now? It's both figuratively and also currently. And it's also future. You save your life. Maybe the, the behavior you're doing is going to lead you to an illness. Or is going to lead you to, to a death. Like maybe you're, you're a road rager. I am not a road rager. I make a plan about people going through the red lights around this town, but I don't road rage. I just grumble a lot. But if you're a road rager and you're, you're in and out and you're brake checking people, have you ever seen that on, on TikTok? People brake checking big trucks? I mean, you're not all there. I watched, I watched a bunch of the different ones where the, these people would brake check this trucker. He puts his videos up all the time. A little, little, little car gets right in front of him, brake checks a semi, full load, 120,000 pounds. Like, that kind of behavior could end your life. Right? Whoever wants to save their life, that's like the here and now, will lose it. But whoever, wants to, whoever loses their life for me will save it. And so what, what's this, this verse saying? It's kind of like an oxymoron. Well, what it's saying is when you give what you have to the Lord and you trust him with it, you will in that place start to find true salvation. Because you empty yourself of your pride. You empty yourself of your sin. You empty yourself of your abilities, even though you have them. You, you say, God, I, I know what I can do, but here's what I can't do as well. I give it all to you. Don't just give God what you don't have. Give him what you do have. So Every day, get up. And just give it to him. Say, God, I, I, I am broken. I am discouraged. I am depressed. I want you to know, friends, in the Bible, there are lots of characters, lots of people, and lots of great saints who were depressed, discouraged, and suicidal, and God saved them all. The only ones that, 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 that uh, never made it were the ones that didn't trust God, like Judas. Judas may have betrayed Jesus, but he could have been forgiven. How do we know that? Because Peter betrayed Jesus as well, and Jesus reinstated Peter. As long as you're drawing breath, there is still hope for a better tomorrow and a brighter future in his name. And so that's what we see. We want to, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for Jesus will save it. So die to yourself. That's what discipleship is. It's dying to yourself. It's not a program of going out and witnessing to people on the street corner. If you're good at that, God bless you. May he, may he make your ministry fruitful. But you know what the true ministry is in your life? Dying to yourself. I like what Dietrich Bonhoeffer says. I, he, has such, he has such a great worldview uh, and faith. Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. And I think what, what breaks my heart the most is, because I've been in this place in the past, is to call yourself a Christian and you don't know who Jesus is. To wake up in the morning and go, I, I don't know who God is. To, to pray and say, am I really praying to him at all? I, I, don't, I don't know. Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. And it is true. Discipleship is, is your life. It's giving of yourself to him so that when you're at work, you're still a disciple. 
You know, you shouldn't have this, this, this transformation like a, like a Transformer. Remember Transformers in the 80s? Oh, uh, I watched a couple of 80s cartoons recently. It was one of them was Transformers. Good times, right? Great animation. Any 80s kids in here? I'm the only one. Come on, are you all, you're, all, you're all afraid to admit it. Well, I, anyways, I, every once in a while, I still have kids, so I'll watch, you know, Transformers, and they all... And that's amazing. I, I forgot how great that was. It was great, such a great show. Anyways, sometimes we do that in our lives. We transform when we go to work, and we become this gruff, rough, kind of ungodly person because we want to fit in. You know, as an adult, you still struggle with peer pressure just like teenagers do. And don't you deny it. That you, 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 you know, you, you restrain yourself when you're around certain people and you let yourself go around other people so that you could fit in with whatever the thing is. We are called to be a peculiar and strange people. Just let that sit in for a second. <laughs> Think of it. We're called to be peculiar. I've got that one on lock. So if you want to know how to be peculiar, I can make a room strange. No problem at all. That's easy to do. But we are called to be different in the world around us. There's, they need to see that, hey, you know what? He got mad, but, you know, it was kind of dorky, but it wasn't really, didn't, didn't hurt anybody's feelings or anything. Oh, you know, they, they, got, they get discouraged. They, they're, they're crying, but yet they're still lifting their hands. They're still going back to, to the Lord. Like, they don't seem to give up. Because I, I preach this every once in a while is never give up. Never, ever give up. The world may come against you. You may fall to your knees. You may even have to crawl on the ground. But you know what? Never give up because the spirit of the living God is at dwelling with inside of your soul. The power of God is within the members of your body. And as long as you draw a breath, he's got something for you to do today. And he wants to instill his love, his mercy, and his kindness in your life so that you can keep moving forward in him. Make sure that your Christianity is not Christless. Make sure that it is full of Jesus. So how, so how, do we, um, how does discipleship change your life? Here's some practical steps. It teaches us to trust in God. We, we need to trust in God. I fear that one of the reasons why a lot of people fall away from the Lord, and, and again, I will in the, in the later ser- series in, in August, we'll talk about this, but I'll give you a little morsel right now. I fear the reason why a lot of people walk away from their faith is because it's built completely on Scripture and not on relationship. Christianity, faith in, in, without a relationship in, with the living God, is not faith. It's an accessory, like I've already mentioned. So it teaches us to trust in God. We say, well, what's, what's so big about trusting in God? Trusting in God means... I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't have an answer to this problem, but I am going to believe in the promises that are written throughout the Word of God, and I'm going to trust in the the connection I've made with God through Jesus Christ, my Savior, my Lord, who I talk to every day. I'm going to trust Him through this storm. I'm going to trust Him through this dry time. I'm going to trust Him in this difficult situation. I'm going to trust Him when it's really good and the sun is shining. But every day, I'm going to take it one day at a time. Sweet Jesus. Because you've made a relationship connection with the living God. I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of uh, atheists get mad at Christians. Because that's what sets us apart from other religions. We have a living, breathing, uh, growing connection with the Creator. And the best part is we didn't earn it. We, We don't earn it. There's nothing we can do to get to heaven as far as in and of our abilities. The only way we get to experience the joy and the peace and the love and the blessings of God is by denying ourselves, picking up our cross, and following Jesus through repentance and through acceptance of Christ in our life. And so it teaches us the trust in God. See, when we deny the urge of self-reliance, we open ourselves to completely rely on God for our success. That's just the way it is. When we deny that urge of self-reliance. And I think that's where, if you're struggling sometimes with hearing God's voice, are you relying on yourself a lot? Well, you know, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. Well, I'll just buy my way out of it. I can, I can pay for it. I'm good. It's, it's interesting to note that throughout history, the more affluent a society becomes, the less godly it becomes. The more stuff we have, the less God we have. 
So am I saying that we should all just empty ourselves and become poor on the street? No. I'm saying we need to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and if God is telling us to, to give something away, so be it. But you will know. Don't go just give it to a televangelist because they say they need some money. Ask God. Talk to Him. Trust in Him. And let Him lead you. But that's why I always say it's always better to get involved in a local church and be accountable to a body that, that you can also be, you're not just you are accountable, but they're accountable to you, and, and we work together as the body of Christ should. You know, support your local church ministry, you know, and, and the missions that they're doing around the world. I'm excited that there's going to be some interesting announcements coming up um, with our orphanage over in Ukraine soon. I'm looking forward to, to hearing what Fred has to tell us about that. These are things that we can do as a body. Right? Like, look at last week. We, we pulled some resources together and we got equipment replaced so that the message of Christ can still get, get put out there online. And we're going to be doing another project that's not only going to increase that, that footprint, but it's also going to allow us to, to bless a, a mission work as well. I mean, this is great stuff, what we're doing. Each, each month we support um, the Upper Room Mission. We support the gleaners locally so that they, they can do the great ministry that they, they do to help those that are less fortunate and, and bring the word and the love of Christ to to those individuals. See, it teaches us to trust in God. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love Him, who are called according to His purpose. All things work together for good. So, maybe you've had something bad happen in your life. Maybe you've lost something of importance in your life. God wants to work that for your good. He doesn't want, your, he doesn't want bad things to happen to you. So then what, it always leads to the question is, well, why do bad things happen to good people? Because good people are in a bad world. It's the, it's the, it's the only answer that, that really suffices. Why do bad things happen to good people? Because good people are in a bad world. You know, um, sociologists will say that people are in, born inherently good. And I even hear Christians say this all the time. Oh, people are born, they're born good. No, we're not. Scripture does not agree with you on that. Scripture says that we are born in sin and shapen in iniquity. We have to learn and we have to accept the, 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 the change that only God can offer his people, those who call on his name. And so we see that all things, again, work together for good. So maybe something bad has happened to your life. Maybe you were abused. I want you to know something, that God didn't want that abuse to happen to you, but he can turn that into something that you can be used in your life to bless you and help you uh, uh, move in the, the plan and the path that he has for your life. That he could completely and utterly heal you from the inside out so that you no longer feel the sting of that abuse any longer. That doesn't mean that the abuse will ever go away from your history. But it means that the history will no longer define who you are in him. That is good news, friends. That is good news. Dwight Moody says, let God have your life. He can do, do more with it than you can. Isn't that true? He really can. Think of what you were like before you knew Jesus. Before you started on this, advent, this great adventure called faith, think of what you were before. Think of where you are today and see the improvement. If you've gone 10 years and there's been no improvement, I, I feel sorry for you. I didn't say that your life was going perfect. I just said if you haven't seen any improvement and growth in him, then I feel sorry for you. Because this adventure that we're on is the greatest adventure anybody could ever hope to dream up. You realize you're, you're, the odds are stacked against you as believers to follow him. The world is against you. Like the giant is out there in the world and we're like little David. Just the, those who are true believers of Christ, those who are born again of, of heart and soul. You, you realize that? Like we're, we're, we're up against the giant every day and we win every day. And that's what we need to understand. That's what discipleship is. It's a decision that I am constantly going to trust in God and whatever comes my way. Uh, Proverbs 16, 9 says, The heart of man plans his way, but it is the Lord who establishes his steps or her steps. I want you to know today, God will establish your steps. But in order for those steps to get established, you've got to make some tracks in the sand. So put your feet in front of one another and just keep walking. Or if you want to go back to, a, to the animation, right? Just keep swimming. Remember the little fish in Nemo? Just keep swimming. Well, sometimes you just got to keep walking. And God will, will, will walk you through the path. And he will get you through to the other side. The second thing um, for discipleship that changes your life is it calls us to be Christ-like. 
Right? We're, we're called to be the, imit the imitation or the imitators of Christ. We are called to, to be like him. Scripture is very, very clear. If you look through Scripture, we're called to be like him. See, Dallas Willard sums it up like this. Um, discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. That is, that is revolutionary to me. Think of it. Discipleship is that process. It's not, it doesn't end in one day. You don't accept Jesus today and tomorrow you're a perfect Christian. Not going to happen. In fact, you will go. I'm sure we've got, do we have anybody in, the, in 60 years of, of following Jesus in here? Anybody? Any of our any seniors who have been following Jesus for 60 years? 50 years. Do we have any 50s? There we go. Any, any 40s? There we go. 30s? There we go. I don't mean your age. I mean how long you've been following Jesus. 20. You got some 20 year followers? We got any two year followers? Yeah. Those, that's awesome. You, you see that, 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 that this is a beautiful thing that is happening. It's calling you to become Christ like. And, and it's a process. It, over those. 2 and 20 and 30, 40, 50, 60 years of faith. Are you different today than you were the day you accepted Jesus? Has he become more real and more, more prominent in your life? Is he, is he leading you uh, closer today than he did uh, when you first believed? Those are questions that you want to ask yourself. Does it make you look more like him? When people deal with you, do they realize there's something different about you? And that's how you know you're on the right path. When people can see that there's something different about you, because you can be a good, you can be a good at, at, at acting. When I was a teenager, I was at church, and I was involved in, in all that, but I wasn't a true believer. I was a good, good person, didn't get into trouble, never came home in a cop car, never been wasted, never made children outside of marriage, you know, all that kind of stuff. I never did any of that stuff. But my heart was not following Jesus. And the day that I accepted Christ, I'll never forget it. It, was, it wasn't the day of, but a few, a few weeks or a few months later, I can't remember exactly, a lady in my church who knew me since I was a young one walked up to me and said, I, I, there's something different. And then I told her all about it, and she cried. Because people come into Jesus at any age should cause us emotional movement. Because in heaven, there's a party going on when somebody comes to Christ. Why on earth is there not a party in, on the earth when the people come to Jesus? So if you're new here, you accepted Jesus recently, you let me know, I will throw a cake and a party for you. We need to get back to celebrating those kinds of great steps. Because he whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And in a world that is increasingly losing its freedom, in Christ Jesus, we can still be free, even though the world is trying to hold us in bondage. Romans 12, 2 says, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you will be able to discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. What's the will of God for your life? That you look more like Jesus today than you did yesterday. That you want to follow him, and you pick up your cross every day. You deny who you want to be, and you follow him anyways. When people insult you, you don't take it personal. You don't get even. You allow vengeance to be the Lord's job. Although I do like the Sean-inspired version of that verse. Vengeance is mine and the Lord said it. I prefer that one. But the real verse is vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I still like my version better. But when we deny that, that version, that Sean version, we, don't want, we should never want that one. We should deny that one. It brings us into closer alignment with Jesus. And it's the perfect will of God for your life. So it calls us to be more Christ-like. And then the last thing today as we wrap up, it positions us, discipleship positions us for growth and blessing. Is there anybody here who doesn't want to be blessed? You just want to have curses all over your life all the time? Good. I'm glad nobody put up your hand. If you did, we'll, we'll lay hands on you later and pray that out. That's got to go. I, I, I think any sensible person wants to be blessed. We, we want, to, we want thing, good things to happen through our lives and to our lives. And, and we want that to be who we are. Well, discipleship will position you for growth and blessing. The closer you are to Jesus, the more you become like him. The more he can bless you. Do you give disobedient children presents? 
That's a bad parenting strategy if you do. I have three, I know, it doesn't work. If you, if you bless children when they're doing naughty things, they become more entitled and more naughty. Well, we are big kids, and if God was to bless us and, and, and give us things, good things, when we're doing wrong actions, he's not a good father. A good father, scripture says, disciplines his kids. Aren't we so blessed that God will discipline us? He doesn't discipline us to hurt us. He disciplines us to bring us back into alignment. To show us that he's got a better plan. If you'd stop being self-centered and self-focused, if you would follow his path and his way, over a period of time, you will see the benefits of what he's leading you into. And so, um, discipleship will position you for growth and for blessing. See, to become more like Jesus is a lifelong process of slow growth that produces good spiritual fruit. And in the Okanagan, it is fruit season. It is a good time right now in the Okanagan, right? All that fruit. Yeah, I see people on, the, on some of the roadways just picking them right off there. I was watching a couple people uh, this past week picking, I think it was, must have been cherries, and they're just picking them off. They're going at it. It was really, they look like they're having a good time. But we're called to also be fruitful. We're called to be fruitful. We're called to be a blessing. If you want to be blessed, bless others. You want to see God's favor unleashed in your life? Put some favor on other people. Give, and it will come back to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and then running over. Who wants to have a life like that? Well, that's what discipleship will do for you. Isaiah 119 says, if you are willing and obedient, not if you're willing or obedient, it's willing and obedient. You notice that the obedience comes after you're willing to do it? See, the Bible's amazing. From front to back, everything is put in proper order. It doesn't say if you're obedient and willing. It doesn't say if you're willing or obedient. You have to have a willingness to be obedient. And then you will eat the good of the land. If you want to see blessings come in your life, don't expect to get blessing when you're not following God's commands. See, we're not just called to be good people. We're called to be repentant sinners who are in the image of Christ in our day-to-day -day lives. Not just a church in a nice shirt, all cleaned up. We're, we're, we're called to be cleaned up on the inside out. I would rather people come and, and rip clothes to church, but inside they are all cleaned up because they have willingly and obediently followed Jesus who loves them more than any human being on this earth ever will. Worship team, you can join me. I'm going to close with this last verse. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. You know, something that I've had this talk recently with my family is I, I love to work. I love work. That doesn't mean I want to go at a full out pace all the time. We all need to have rest. We all need time. But I enjoy work. And um, when you're planning out, when you're a teenager and you're planning out your career path, you start working and maybe a part-time job and you start doing some hours and you get that first full-time week. Right, Steph? You get that first full-time week and you're like, man, that's a lot of work. Well, you only got 50 more years to go, right? So you might as well learn to enjoy the work that God sets your heart to. And so whatever God has set you to do, not just in your job, but in, in your family, in your relationships, in, in your service in church, in your service to your community, in your free time, in your fun time, in your downtime, give it all to Jesus as a disciple. Because God is able to bless you abundantly. To bless who? The true disciple who willingly, obediently follows Jesus with their whole heart. And they're transformed from that lowly sinner to that blessed saint on their journey in this life to be in his presence in eternity. But before you get to eternity, you still got this life to finish up. And God has a great life and he wants to bless you in it. And he wants you just to be successful and he wants to help you abound in every good work. Don't look down on work. Enjoy the work. If the work isn't, isn't good for you right now, adjust your, your, your work schedule, so to speak. Adjust the things in your life that are, are, are draining you for the things that fill you. But I will tell you this. If Jesus isn't the thing that fills you every day, isn't the one that, that brings that meaning and that purpose, 
doesn't matter how much work you do, you'll never find that purpose. There's a reason why rich people keep chasing after wealth and never stop until they die. Because wealth doesn't bring the satisfaction. Only Jesus can bring the satisfaction. So friends, I want to encourage you to be disciples. Why don't you stand? I want to pray for you and then we'll close in a song. The marks of discipleship are, are deep and they're wide. And God wants every one of you to be successful in it. And I know that it may be a struggle for some of you sometimes, but I want you to know God is with you. He will never leave you and he will never forsake you. So make sure you remember these important things that discipleship does. It teaches you to trust in God. It calls us to be Christ-like and it posi positions us for growth and blessing. Because Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. And I want to see God do the opposite in one of our lives. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are so good. You have transformed our lives. And for those, God, maybe they, they don't know you in this place yet. Maybe they haven't made that transformation. I, I pray, Lord Jesus, that they would realize their need of you. And that today would be the day of salvation as they give their heart willingly and obediently to you. That this would be a room filled with disciples who are excited and electrified by the Holy Spirit to live for you. I ask, Lord, that for those that are struggling, that you would speak to them with that still, quiet voice and help them to know that you're there. That you would minister to their heart, to their mind, and to their soul would bring them a season of refreshing as they dare to trust in you. As they put Christ centered in you. And Lord, we commit this week to you that as we go out into this community that we would be the hands, the feet, and the voice of our Savior who redeemed us at the cross to this community that we live in. That we would see a new day on in this city of salvation and hope and life. In our Savior Jesus, we ask. Amen.